In the 1960s, at the age of 14, he began preaching at revival meetings and was advertised as the miracle boy evangelist with claims that he could heal the sick and prophesy about the future. Not long after that, Peter Popoff began a television ministry that grew and expanded so that by the 1980s, he was broadcast across the nation. He preached a message of supernatural healing and declared his ability and gifting to heal the sick along with self-purported God-given wisdom to see into the bodies and minds of those who attended his meetings, a kind of psychic ability. All of this was brought to a head in 1986 when a magician and skeptic named James Randi and his friend Steve Shaw decided to attend these healing meetings and figure out what was going on. And what they found was profound deception. And they exposed the deception of Peter Popoff. Randy employed the help of an electronics expert and using radio scanners, he was able to discover that Peter Popoff's wife, Elizabeth, was using a wireless radio transmitter to broadcast information about people in the crowd to a small receiver concealed in Peter Popoff's ear. Mr. Popoff was a fraud. And all of this was revealed on the Johnny Carson Tonight Show, actually. After that, more deception came to light. Fake healings with stage actors put into wheelchairs, financial impropriety and fraud, an allegation even of him burglarizing his own office in order to steal funds that were given by his faithful followers to purchase Bibles for the Soviet Union. It was the 80s after all. In the end, for Peter Popoff, there was bankruptcy and disgrace, but hold on, it was not the end. There's more. In 1998, he staged a comeback and it worked. You can find him today on broadcasts, pulling the exact same shtick that worked for him in the 1980s, complete now with free for the asking so-called miracle spring water that he has anointed and prayed over. I went on his website last week and I had to chuckle in bold red all caps on his website. It says, do not drink miracle spring water. So I don't, I don't know what's going on with that water, but I checked as well at his net worth. It's estimated about $10 million. It's not bad. So in light of that, I have some of my own spring water at the Welcome Center <laughs> for you as you leave. Listen, there are seemingly no end of charlatans in the church. No end of preachers proclaiming that vile and wicked prosperity gospel, so-called, fleecing the flock, declaring that quote, seed faith, faith gifts given to their ministry will result in their debts being canceled or bring healing to them or those they love. I think it's kind of similar to the lottery in which those who can least afford it buy tickets in the hopes of winning. The ongoing aftermath, not only in the States, but sadly we've exported this wickedness to the rest of the world. The ongoing aftermath is damaged and distraught believers and rich, prosperous TV preachers driving Bentleys and wearing Armani suits and living in 20 bedroom mansions. Lies, deceit, false claims from purportedly Christian teachers. But listen, this is not a new phenomenon. 
These aren't just issues that we deal with in our present day. These kinds of things have been present within the church from its earliest days. And it is these kinds of false teachers that Peter addresses in our text this morning. Peter is addressing false teachers in the church who not only preach destructive lies, but whose way of life reveals that they are spiritual charlatans. And he addresses any temptation that we might have as we survey the landscape. That all of this goes on year after year with so many of these men and women continuing to lie in their pockets without any real consequence. Peter has the most serious and sobering kinds of warnings regarding these kinds of false teachers as he informs us of their ultimate destiny. So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2, paying careful attention as we read, for this is the word of God. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. So Peter addresses here a major issue of false teachers, both ancient in his day and up to our current day. Two points in this sermon to help us navigate through this text. The first point is that Peter introduces us to the false teachers. As we concluded chapter one last week, we saw that Peter In opposition, we need to understand to the false teachers he's addressing, he brought forward two witnesses to build confidence in the reader that indeed the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return in majesty and power and will judge the world. We saw that Peter uses the transfiguration of Christ that we find in the gospel accounts, a transfiguration where the veil of his full humanity was in effect pulled aside momentarily. And we read in Matthew 17, his face shined like the sun and his clothes became white as light. And we need to understand that Peter references the transfiguration in Matthew 17, for instance, because of what he said in Matthew 16. For the son of man, Jesus says, The Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. 
Truly I say to you, Jesus says, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And so the transfiguration of Jesus was a glimpse of his divine glory, a foretaste of the glory and majesty he will return in, what he describes as him returning in the glory of his Father. And Peter says, I've seen a glimpse of that glory. It was enough to cast him down to the ground as if he was dead. It was a forecast of his coming glory. And Peter says, I can attest of the glory of Christ as he points us to his glorious return. And then he points to Old Testament prophecy as a reliable witness to God's plan of judgment and redemption in Christ. Peter intends to build confidence in us in that what we read in the Old Testament, indeed throughout all of scripture, well, it was not produced from the will of men. Rather, men spoke from God. So men did speak through their distinct and unique personalities, but when they spoke, when they wrote, they spoke from God, carried along by the Holy Spirit. And that brings us to our text. He says, but, in correlation to what he just said, but we know that not all the prophets described in the Old Testament are divinely inspired. In fact, there's a category you read about regularly in the Old Testament of false prophets who do make an interpretation out of their own mind and will not carried along by the Spirit of God. And Peter says, just as there were false prophets then, there will be false teachers among you now in the present age. Notice he uses a future tense as he addresses present teachers. Why is he doing that? I think it's because he is calling the reader, those who are aware of the teaching of Jesus, to remembrance that Jesus, for instance, he prophesied of these things. Matthew 24, 10 through 12 says, and then, Jesus says, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. And Peter's saying, just as it was prophesied, so it shall be and in fact is. Apparently, the readers were aware of this reality of false teachers that had been called forth from long ago, and Peter's calling this to mind. Look how he describes the false teachers. He says, they secretly bring in destructive heresies. These teachers are deceitful. They are undermining, they are distorting orthodox biblical teaching. Specifically, we find they are saying that in fact Jesus is not returning and therefore one may live however they want. Having believed the gospel and been forgiven, it does not matter how one lives. Now, it is important to be aware of this category of heresy. Heresy is destructive. Heresy can destroy a church and has done many times. Let me say this though. There is a kind of what I will call heresy hunting that is uncharitable and unhelpful. Not everything that believers disagree on is heresy. In fact, we saw in Romans 14 last year that sincere, faithful Christians can differ even on what we are called to do by God in our personal lives of personal convictions. There's matters of conscience that aren't even corrected Instead, the call is to love one another and be united in love. But, saying that, <laughs> there is a departing from the faith once for all delivered to the saints that does bring destruction. There are hills to die on. The trustworthiness and authority of God's word the wrath-bearing, substitutionary death and bodily resurrection of Christ, his ascension, his coming return, and that salvation is found in no other name than his. 
along with the necessity, as Peter said earlier, to confirm our calling and election through imperfect but faithful lives lived to the glory of God. These men are denying orthodox truth that is essential to the Christian faith. They are secretly manipulating and bringing in heresy that will destroy the church. Furthermore, second, he says, they are denying the master who bought them. Verse two, they are engaged eagerly in sensuality. In other words, in their lives, lies that they teach, and in their disobedient to God lifestyles, they deny with their lives that they are servants, indeed slaves of Christ, who owe their allegiance to him. After all, if he isn't returning, as these false teachers claim, you might as well live however you like. Follow any and all sinful desire. And note, this is a popular message, no doubt. Verse two, he says, many will follow these false teachers. And in doing so, the truth is blasphemed. The truth of a real and living and returning Lord and Savior who has purchased the people for himself, who has saved and sanctified a peculiar people who live for his glory and not for our own, that truth is blasphemed. The world looks on all of this as a joke or a kind of baptized version of the materialism and sensuality of the world. It is no wonder that there are many in the world who look at the church engaged in these kinds of activities and the common refrain is the church is full of hypocrites. The truth is blasphemed. Verse three, they are greedy and they are exploiting the sheep for their own financial gain. I follow a couple of Instagram accounts that I find amusing. The first, maybe you've heard of these, they're quite popular. First is Preachers and Sneakers, where the guy who runs the Instagram account, he, he just finds pictures of popular preachers wearing sneakers that are worth thousands of dollars. It's a picture of the preacher and then a picture of the shoe on sale. Can you imagine spending like $3,500 on a pair of sneakers? Maybe you have, it's okay, I'm not judging. Um, <laughs> there's any sneaker heads here. The other one is called Profits and Watches where the guy who runs that account shows a picture of usually a TV preacher, you know, speaking, you know, a screenshot with the watch, and then beside it, an example of the watch being sold for a certain amount. <laughs> I saw recently a popular, what I will call prosperity gospel preacher, was wearing a watch that was on sale for $163,000. I didn't even know there was such a thing. That's like a, wearing a small house on your wrist. You know, it's a, I would be terrified to walk around with that. I would doubt that the many people who give to his so-called ministry have that kind of watch. I also amusingly saw John Piper, if you're familiar with him, pop up on the feed. I was like, oh boy, what do we have here? His watch, a Casio model F91W, sale price, $10.95. <laughs> Listen, my, my point is not to say that Christians can't own and enjoy nice things. Not at all. But when your ministry is built on asking people, actually urging people to support your lavish lifestyle in return for goodies from God, you are aligned with men such as those described here. You are exploiting the sheep for your own gain. Michael Green, New Testament scholar Michael Green sums up these false teachers in describing them this way. Their teaching was flattery. Their ambitions were financial. Their lives were dissolute. Their conscience was dulled. And their aim was deception. 
And listen, it appears that these false teachers are succeeding. Not only in Peter's day, but we could well say now. It seems like they're succeeding in their selfish and sinful practices. But Peter has the most serious and sobering kind of warnings concerning their ultimate end. Verse one, what they face is what he calls swift destruction. Or verse three, condemnation and destruction. And while these may appear to be absent, make no mistake, they are not idle. They are not asleep. It is impending and it is sure. He'll dive further into that reality in the second half of our text. But let me, let me pause for a moment here thinking about the verses that we have looked at so far and consider how this is intended to affect us. Now certainly here is a warning for any who would seek to teach like this or to follow in the footsteps of these false teachers in their sensuality and sin. I wanna take just a second to look at that statement that they deny the master who bought them because this statement is one which should press upon us with a sense of sobering weight. After all, did not Jesus say in Matthew 7, 21 and following, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. as those who have come to know Christ by his grace, we are bought with a price, his precious blood, and he is our master. And anyone who denies his authority proves that they do not actually know Christ. New Testament scholar Peter David says, when one ignores the teaching of Jesus or the instruction of his father, one is in practice despising their lordship. Such persons may still be honoring Jesus or his father with their lips. They may be energetic worshipers, but their actions betray them in that they have thrown off all authority over their lives. And so when we're considering the false teachers here or false teachers that we see in our day. No, no, there's no, there is no room in us for self-righteousness. Now, rather, when we read a text like this, that what is for us is a moment for self-examination. Is there any area of our lives where we are, in effect, resisting the authority of Christ? Maybe it is a general sense in which we are submitted to Christ, but there's that one area, that one precious sin that we hold dear. All of it, Jesus, but not this. I'll hide that away. Resist his authority. That is a dangerous and grievous place to be in. And so the psalmist prays, and this is a, a wonderful prayer if you do not already have this in your prayer arsenal, your scripture, scriptural prayer, Psalm 139, 23 and following, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Maybe as I speak, you are immediately... <laughs> aware of an area or areas in your life where you are not submitted to Christ. You have hidden away a portion. Jesus, you may have most, but not all. If you are aware of an area in your life, an area of sin, an area of resistance to Christ, and you oh, you you are experiencing the pain and sorrow of that conviction. Oh, the mercy 
of God is such that if you are aware of an area in your life like this, that is not where God intends to leave you. He is graciously and kindly making you aware of your sin so that you can experience new grace, fresh grace, because those who have been bought by the blood of Christ are those who know and experience his grace. Grace to forgive your sin and grace to rise from your chair this morning empowered to go to war against your sin and to submit yourselves anew and afresh to Christ. Yes, imperfectly, but sincerely and faithfully so that you embrace the words of Paul this morning in 1 Corinthians 6.20, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. And so Peter, Peter introduces us to the false teachers and has words that penetrate to each one of our hearts as well. Second point, he presses into the judgment that is coming to false teachers. Peter has already declared destruction and judgment that is coming for these false teachers. And so then he provides three Old Testament stories that prove God's capacity and willingness to judge the wicked, along with his promises to rescue and preserve the righteous. But let's look at the judgment first. Verse four, God did not even spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. He's referring to the day of the Lord, the judgment of Christ in his return. Now, what is he talking about? Well, the traditional understanding of this text is Peter making a reference back to a most peculiar text in Genesis chapter 6. I think it's one of the more strange and difficult texts. But we read there, we'll put it up, when man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, judgment, my spirit shall not abide in man forever for he is flesh, his days shall be 120 years and the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Traditional understanding of that text is that these sons of God, which are differentiated from daughters of man, are, it's describing a scenario where angels took human women as wives. Cross species mating, I think that's strange. But apparently very important for us because there is judgment declared there. God cuts the life of man shorter. This is immediately before the flood, which we'll look at in a moment. And it appears that Peter had access to later commentary about Genesis 6 that informed this more detailed description of how God judged angels. The point is, though, that God, not to get hung up on minutia, the point is God was willing to judge even the angels of heaven for their wickedness. Second, he brings up the story of Noah and the flood. He preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, and his life certainly was distinct from the wickedness that surrounded him. For those bound for destruction, God preserved the lives of him and seven others. Eight, Noah and his wife, their three sons and their wives. And then he did as he had promised. He brought a devastating, extinction-level flood upon the ungodly. Thinking about that way, maybe that colors, singing about Noah and the arky arky. (laughs) Third, God, in effect, nuked Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes for their wickedness. Their wickedness described in Scripture as an acceptance and celebration of sexual sin, along with their arrogant pride. And God judged them for this. We read in Genesis 19, 23 and following, the sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. 
in all of this. Here's what Peter's doing. He's arguing. He's helping us to see that though it may appear that the wicked are winning, the false teachers are prospering, when one considers how God has been true to his promises to judge wickedness as seen throughout history, that he is not absent-minded or unwilling to righteously judge, that should inform our present certainty that God will judge the unrighteous specifically and centrally when Christ returns to judge the living and the dead. So we opened our meeting this morning where Kevin invited us to consider the past faithfulness of God to strengthen our faith that he will be faithful. He has been faithful and he will be faithful. Here, Peter's doing something we don't see a lot. He is saying, be certain that God will judge in his righteous wrath. Know this because he has already done it in the past. This is sobering stuff. It's scary. Yet in all of this, Peter also wants us to see that God, in his kindness and mercy, will never neglect his people. They will not experience this wrath. He will rescue and care for his own. Note, he said, look, he preserved Noah as he promised. He rescued, described here as righteous Lot. Now understand, if you're familiar with the biblical narratives, these were flawed men. Noah's drunkenness and shame. It would be hard to read the account of Lot and come away on your own thinking, that was a really righteous guy. <laughs> Pretty greedy. Here's the point. These men, though, Sinners, as all are, and with their flaws, their hearts were ultimately toward God, toward obedience to God, imperfectly but sincerely. You see this throughout Scripture. All of our biblical heroes have issues. David, is it amazing to you, it is to me, that in Hebrews 11, Samson? We see the fruit of God's work in Lot's life here as well. His righteous soul was tormented over the lawless deeds that he saw each day. Uh, as, I, as I read this, I have a concern for myself and for us as a church. Does that important principle reflect the way we look at the world? I, I pray that we do not become so comfortable within this world that we are desensitized by media and entertainment to the tragedy of the sin and wickedness in our surrounding culture. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, my eyes shed, my eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. Those who think this way, those who feel this way, well, that, that just simply reflects a sincere heart and passion for the glory of God and a sorrow that he is, as described earlier, and his truth are blasphemed in the world. Lot had that heart for all his issues and even for his sins. He had a heart for God. I pray that we would be those who know what it is like at times in the joys of this world, yet to, in moments, weep at the public and proud sins of our culture. Not self-righteously, not at all, but because we love our God. and we feel the sorrow that we are surrounded by sin that offends the God we love. Lot felt that way. There's something here reflected of what the heart of a believer is like. 
verse 10, he says, there is judgment coming once again. He reminds those described earlier in the chapter, those who have given themselves over to sinful passion and desire and resist the authority of God, they despise God's authority. Oh, their judgment is coming. But note for us, for every believer in Christ, those accounted as righteous only in Christ. Verse nine, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial. Oh, that's sweet. This, this is a sobering text. This, this text should, should wake us up to realities that maybe we do not consider deeply enough. But here present, for each one of us who are in Christ, there is a precious reminder. In our trials, the Lord is present, and he knows how to and will rescue his own. Let me say this, if, if you're not a Christian, maybe you came here with a friend or just out of curiosity, checking out the church thing. Listen, the sobering reality of God's righteous judgment against every sinner in and of ourselves is intended to wake us up to the reality of a holy God. And that if we die in our sin, there is a real hell waiting for each one of us. But, oh, I have good news. I have the best news for you. The good news, the gospel, is that Christ took upon himself your gloomy darkness and chains. Christ was overwhelmed in the flood of God's judgment in the place of sinners. He experienced the righteous wrath of God against sinners that would turn each one of us to ashes. And so, if you will turn from your sin and put your trust in him and his death and resurrection, he will deal with the greatest trial you could ever face and he will rescue you from the judgment that is yours in your sin and he will save you. Oh, I pray that you will trust him, that you will turn to him even in this moment and come to experience his saving grace. And beloved, aren't you grateful to be reminded that the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. Oh, what a sweet and precious truth for each one of us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation, that word can also be trial, has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Maybe you've arrived here and you are in a significant trial, a season of suffering, experiencing the pummeling effect of daily temptations to sin. Listen, you, you need to know God is with you in your trial and he will not let your soul be lost. If you are suffering, if you find yourself in a trial, listen, do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. God is with you in your trial and ultimately he will deliver you out of your trial. He will rescue you. He knows exactly how to do it and he has promised that he will do it. Listen, there, there is a day coming when Christ returns where there will be no more trials. There is a day coming in the return of Christ where there will be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more suffering, no more death. Oh, beloved saint, persevere. The Lord is with you and he knows exactly how to and will deliver you out of your trial. That is the promise we find here, and it is 
supremely precious to us. Let me close with this. Oh, just a seemingly endless proliferation of false teachers and those who shamefully exploit others. Not only in Peter's day, thousands of years ago, but as we all know, in this day. I mean, I had a, just a heartbreaking thought as I prepared this sermon. Right now, there are men and women getting ready to launch deceitful ministries to exploit the sheep. That will be the case till he returns. By the way, we believe here that God does heal powerfully, supernaturally. We pray for that. We press into that. There are gifts of healing described in Scripture. Lest you be mistaken in my introduction that I was somehow minimizing that reality. Not at all. What I'm referring to is the exploitation that Peter describes here. Second Peter helps us orient our thinking as we make <clears throat> our way through this world. So whatever appearances may be, God is not forgetful or absent or slack in his promises. He will judge those opposed to him. And he will keep his own to the day of Christ. And we pray then, Lord, haste that day. Amen.